This message is part of the teaching provided by House on the Rock Fellowship, a church caring for the Miami Valley region. Before you listen, be sure to access the notes in the download section of the message page. Have a Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. Why are you here? Here. What are you doing here? I think those are real important questions. Maybe you showed up here to listen and to watch because it's a habit that you've always had. Meaning you go to church on Sunday and you, you listen to someone talk and you sing some songs and you, you put something in the plate and it's just a part of your rhythm. And even if that's true, could we back it up just a little bit more? Why are you doing it? Why is being here a part of your Sunday morning? I pray if we kept backing that question up, eventually you'd get to Jesus. To be more like Jesus, to worship Jesus, to pray to Jesus, to, to walk in relationship with him more and more. And, and I think that's the right answer. I, I think Jesus is where that logic needs to flow. And I think loving and kindness and serving and sacrificial being are all a part of what it means to be a Jesus follower, a Christian. But if all of those things are true and we're here to be more like Jesus, then what do you do with a verse like this? Let me read it for you. This is from Luke chapter 5. Verse 16, it says, But he, Jesus, would withdraw to desolate places and pray. That verse says that Jesus had a regular habit of pulling back, of going away, of in the midst of everything that's going on, in the midst of busyness and hectic, and a schedule that doesn't seem to stop, Jesus would often step back to catch his breath. Mark is a great example. You have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark's the shortest of the four, and Mark is written in such a way that it has a very quick tempo about it. Um, we're teaching an adult class on the Gospel of Mark. You should go. And, and in that, Mark uses these phrases, and immediately Jesus would do this, and immediately Jesus would go here. It has this very fast tempo. While at the same time, throughout that hectic schedule, Mark highlights the fact that Jesus would pull back, that Jesus would step away. Let me just read some of these for you uh, out of the Bible. A lot of these come from Mark. In, in Mark chapter 1, the Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness. It says in verse 35, rising very early in the morning, while it was dark, he departed and went to a desolate place and he prayed. In another chapter, chapter two, he went out again beside the sea. In chapter three, he went up on the mountain and people called to him. In Luke chapter six, in these days, he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer. In Matthew 14, now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. So again and again, in a lot of different types of situations, whether uh, in the midst of a hectic schedule, Jesus would pull away to catch his breath. He would go up and sit on the mountain and pray. Or in some passages, we see him taking a long walk by the sea. In one passage in John chapter 7, Jesus, his brothers come up to him, his half brothers, and they say, hey, are you going to go down to Jerusalem? Now, they're up in Galilee. They're up in the Capernaum area. Okay, so they're about 90 miles away. And there's a big feast, a big festival that's going on in, in Jerusalem. And Jesus would love to go to the temple and love participating in these things. And so his brothers ask him, hey, do you want to go down to the festival and we'll all go down together? Jesus said, no, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. And so his brothers left. And then it says, and a little bit later, Jesus went down by himself, which means for five days, Jesus was just walking in silence and in solitude. If you're someone who likes to take notes, here's an insight that you might want to write down. Jesus 
would intentionally step back and catch his breath. Write that down. Think about it. Because we're here to be like Jesus. That Jesus would intentionally, he would make the conscious choice to step back and catch his breath. Before making big decisions, we see him going up on the mountain to pray for quiet. When coming out of big seasons of ministry, we see Jesus pulling back to catch his breath. When Jesus gets devastating news about the death of a loved one, it says that Jesus pulled back to a desolate place to catch his breath. And to pray. It was a part of his habit. It was a, a part of his rhythm. Jesus recognized that sometimes we need to breathe in and sometimes we need to breathe out. That we are in rhythms of serving and going and doing. But the other side of that means that we need to be breathing in also. And so if this is true of Jesus, and Jesus is our model that he intentionally would make stepping back a priority to catch his breath, can't we also say then, that his followers should do it too? Because listen to this verse. At a very important moment, in a very intense time of ministry, Jesus has this to say to his followers. This is in Mark 6, verses 31 and 32. And he said to them, his followers, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. All right, so here we see Jesus making a priority of catching his breath, of pulling back, of seasons of intense ministry, followed by seasons of stepping away uh, to be in silence and solitude. And then saying the same thing to his followers. Jesus didn't seem to idolize being busy. In fact, Jesus seemed to make silence and solitude a priority for his followers saying, hey, you too, why don't you step back? We need to catch our breath. Come with me to a desolate place. Let's be renewed and refreshed. I mean, let's just think about the rhythms of life. I mean, look around at creation. There's a rhythm. If you go down to the seashore, what does the tide do? Well, it comes in and then it goes out. And then it comes in and then it goes out. The day follows the night. Our bodies are by nature coordinated to follow that pattern. That there's times when we are to be active and there's times where our body is designed to slow down, cool down, and shut down for a while. Think of your breath. Physically, you breathe in and then you breathe out. Jesus models this and we need to learn how to do the same. So let me ask you then, what happens when we don't? What happens when we don't respect the rhythm of the spiritual life that Jesus both modeled for us and mandated that we keep? What do you think would happen? What happens to a physical body if it doesn't respect the rhythm of breathing in and breathing out? What do you think would happen to us spiritually? I want to share with you an example of someone who had to learn that the hard way. Back in July, I began a deep personal study on one particular individual in the Old Testament a great firebrand, if you will, in the Bible. I mean, this, this is an individual who confronted kings and queens. This is an individual who confronted entire geopolitical systems of evil. Incredible stories of faith and demonstrations of power. A man who literally told the rain to stop. A man who raised the dead. He called fire to the earth. A fiery servant of God. And maybe you've guessed it. His name is Elijah. Interestingly enough, this man, Elijah, 
James in his book later in the New Testament say, yeah, Elijah, we're just like him. He's just like us. Which blows my mind when you think of the ministry and all the things that he accomplished. But there's also something about the life of Elijah as we have it in Scripture that's really frustrated and confused me. Okay, I, I want to give you a, a, little, a little background to, to the story. Because right in the middle of it, things fall apart. I mean, he's doing so well. I mean, he shows up out of nowhere in 1 Kings 17. He goes before the king and, and the evil queen, Jezebel. He says, listen, because of the idolatry here and the way you're corrupting the nation, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And then he's gone. God provides for him in miraculous ways down uh, by the river. God sends him up into enemy territory, up in Zarephath. Uh, and he dwells there for a while, does miraculous events. Then he comes to this place where he says there needs to be a showdown, a showdown between evil and good, a showdown between the prophets of Baal and their false way and God's prophet, me. And so he goes back down to Israel where Ahab's been looking all over for the place for him, says, hey, I'm calling you out. You gather up all of your priests and all of your prophets and you meet me on Mount Carmel and we'll see whose God is really God. In fact, you tell the whole nation to come out and watch. And, and many of you know the story. They all gather at Mount Carmel and it's, it's Elijah all by himself and hundreds of prophets, of false prophets and, and priests of Baal. And he challenges them. He says, hey, you build an altar, I'll build an altar. You call down fire, I'll call down fire. And whichever God shows up, he's God. And so the prophets go through their routine. Nothing happens. Elijah rebuilds the altar for Israel. He prays and fire comes down and consumes it. Elijah goes and he executes all the false uh, priests and all the false prophets. He prays rain comes back after three years of famine. I mean, talk about an emotional and spiritual and ministerial high. I mean, this is a high watermark. And all of a sudden, something happens. And I'm not saying you've done the things that Elijah has done, or I've done the things that Elijah has done. But I think we're going to find in the next few verses of the story that we've been in this place that Elijah finds himself in. And I think it'll be helpful for us because some of us have lost our breath. Some of us have lost our way. Let me read for you. And this is in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 5. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 5. You follow along. Imagine, if you will, the music, the climax. Watch it as a movie. Then all of a sudden, things go bad quickly. It says this in 1 Kings 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done how he'd killed all the prophets by, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he arose, ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And after and left his servant there. Verse four, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die saying, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. Can you feel that something's off? I mean, here is a man for verse after verse and scene after scene is winning. Kings can't stand up to him. Evil can't touch him. He's calling down fire. He's calling down rain. He raises the dead. He, he lays the religious systems of falsehood to, to the sword. And then all of a sudden... He hears that Jezebel's mad at him and that she wants to come kill him. I mean, he must have known that for years now. What is it now all of a sudden 
that now he's afraid and now he runs. He's giving, he's serving, he's doing big things. I want to read the rest of the passage for you. And I want you to follow along because I think we see a man who's lost his breath and God helps him catch it again. Follow with me. This is 1 Kings 19. I'm going to pick up right where I stopped and I'm going to read through to the end. Follow along in the story. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey, it's too great for you. And Elijah arose and ate and drank. And when in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, Well, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said, go out, stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in a cloak, went out, and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, But I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. It's an amazing story. And I think it's really helpful for us to reflect on because I think some of us have lost their breath. But let's look and see, what are the things that happen when we lose our breath? What are the things that happen when we don't respect the rhythm that Jesus both modeled and mandated for his followers. Maybe these things would be helpful for you to write down. So what happens when we lose our breath? Number one, we lose control of our emotions. We lose control of our emotions. Let me give you a second to write that down. Elijah has dealt with Jezebel before. And Ahab before. He's been in Jezebel's hometown. He's been living underneath Jezebel's parents for three years. Why is it all of a sudden now he is afraid and so afraid that he goes on the run? And one of the things that happen 
when we lose our breath is that we lose control of our emotions. I think you can certainly and should see the wind and the earthquake and the fire as very real physical things. But I think we could also understand them as deep emotional things too. That this is what's going on inside of Elijah. He feels this torrential wind and he's exhausted. He feels everything quaking on the inside, a burning on the inside. Do you know what it means to not have control over your emotions? That you snap at the slightest thing and you don't know why. Is it maybe because you've lost your breath? A second thing that happens when we lose our breath, we lose relationships. We lose relationships. If you remember back to the story, he goes on the run because he's afraid and he immediately isolates himself. He takes his servant, drops him off in another part of the country. Then he himself goes and isolates. Now, it's not, he's not seeking solitude. Okay, Big difference. Solitude has this there's this outpouring of strength into it. It's a way to renew. He's not doing that. He isolates himself. It says he goes out into the wilderness. He distances himself from others, but also listen to the way he talks. When God confronts him, why are you here? He says things like this. Well, I'm the only one who's left. I'm all alone but he's been all alone for years. He alone stands up on Mount Carmel. He alone comes into before Ahab and Jezebel and talks and stops the rain. He alone goes off to Jeropheth. He's been alone before, but he hasn't been where he is right now. And that's isolated. We have to be really careful. When we don't respect the rhythms of God, we end up in an isolated place. We lose relationships, which is so very sad because we're here for others. We're here to care for others and nurture others. And yet because of our lack of good stewardship of our own life, we will end up pushing people away. When we lose our breath, we lose relationships. A third thing that you might want to write down. We lose our bearing. We lose our bearing. Throughout Elijah's story, he goes where he goes and he does what he does up until this point because he's prompted by God to do it. God says, hey, go to this valley and now go to this mountain and now go to this town and, and go to this river. And, and, and so he's acclimated all within this area that is Israel. He finds out that Jezebel is out to get him and he goes on the run to the south. He drops off his servant in an area of Judah and then it says he heads off into the wilderness. Wilderness is a dangerous place in Scripture. Israel, after they leave Egypt, wander in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of wandering. It's a place where evil things dwell. <clears throat> when we lose our breath, we lose our bearing. We get off the path. We lose our orientation between what God is doing, what others are doing, what we need to be doing. A fourth thing, and it flows right out of the one before it, because we've lost our bearing, we end up losing perspective. We lose perspective. You listen to things that, that Elijah says in his conversation with God. He says, I'm the only one who's left. The people, they've abandoned you, God. They've, they've torn down your, your, your altars. They're not following you. I, I am the only one who's here. None of those things are true. Jezebel tore down the altars. Jezebel's priests are doing these things. And Elijah isn't the only one. 
We find that out at the end of the passage, that God has reserved others. And there's other places where it's alluded to the fact that there are other prophets. He's not alone, but he's lost so much perspective. He's gotten off the path so far, he can't see things clearly. All he can see is himself. He becomes self-consumed. It's me. It's I. Because he's lost his breath. And isn't that you? I mean, imagine if you will, you've lost your breath physically. And so what are you, what's the only thing that you're focused on? Getting that breath back. When I would teach lifeguarding back in the day, and you're teaching young students how to recognize drowning and how to handle drowning and how to approach someone who's drowning, the person who's drowning, their only concern is getting oxygen and staying alive. They're not concerned about you. And the same thing will happen to us when spiritually we don't respect the rhythms that Jesus has called us to. And that's exactly where Elijah finds himself. He's lost complete perspective. Because the world needs us. He has started to trust in himself in his own priority. Listen to this passage from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. A devout, healthy follower of God, follower of Jesus Christ, always has God in their perspective, always has Jesus in their frame of reference. They are constantly trusting and pouring into, and God is pouring into them. If we have lost our breath, if we have lost our perspective, it's because we have lost sight to where God is and what God is doing. The fifth thing that we lose when we lose our breath is that we lose purpose. We lose purpose. See, Elijah is God's servant. Throughout his ministry, he will speak of himself as the one who stands before the Lord. That's a, just a way of saying, I serve God. I serve Yahweh. In the same way, a house slave or a house servant stands before a master at his beck and call. This is the same way that Elijah describes himself. I'm here to do whatever God asks me to do. I'm here to confront evil. I'm here to encourage people. I'm here to say yes to what needs to be yes. I'm here to stop what needs to be stopped. He had clear purpose. He knew who he was until he lost his breath until he failed to be renewed, until he lost his bearing and lost his perspective, and with that, lost his purpose. Is there a chance that you are out of breath? How are you talking to people? How are you emotionally Are you living out of your purpose? Or are you a drowning man, woman, just trying to survive? Giving in to the cultural lie that busy is better. Do you find yourself like Elijah? You've isolated yourself. You've lost your bearing. You've lost perspective. Well, then I want you to notice something else. And that's God's faithfulness to Elijah. God's faithfulness to Elijah. That God breathes into Elijah his presence. Like a lifesaver. That when Elijah is by the broom tree, by the wilderness, exhausted and whiny, so whiny, God welcomes it. God listens. God listens to him repeat the same thing over and over and over again. That God breathes his presence 
into Elijah. Not because Elijah deserves it or Elijah's asked for it. Elijah has buried himself under a broom tree in the middle of the wilderness. God breathes his presence into him because he's faithful. God breathes into Elijah provision. Elijah's exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally. And so God breathes into him provision. An angel comes, here's some food. You need to eat. Take a nap. Don't talk, just sleep. Elijah gets up, he eats, he takes a nap. He gets up, here, you need to eat this. You need to drink this. The journey that's ahead of you is more than you can handle right now. Relationally, while Elijah has pushed everyone else away, God has made a point of moving closer to Elijah. He breathes presence and provision into him when Elijah was pushing everyone else away. God breathes into Elijah truth. Elijah's really hung up on some things that are not true. He misreads the culture. He misreads his own ministry and priority. And his identity isn't being wrapped up in who God is. He misses it. That's the whole piece with the, the wind blowing and the earthquake and the fire and God not in those things. Elijah had begun to identify himself with the big and the mighty and the strong. But God is the one who draws near and is in the still, small voice. And so God breathes into him presence and provision, and he speaks truth into him. God breathes into him forgiveness. This is something that um, was so meaningful to me through some difficult times in my own life. You remember, if you go through Elijah's story, and I'd mentioned this earlier, he says and introduces himself like, hey, I'm Elijah, I stand before the Lord. I'm the one who stands before the Lord. I mean, I am God's servant. And so here Elijah's, and he has to be guilt-ridden as he's sitting underneath the broom tree. He has to be completely frustrated and disappointed in himself, his own capacity, his failure. He didn't stand up to Jezebel. He let Jezebel run him off. He has to be overcome with guilt and, and, and sin and shame. And when God speaks to him, what are you doing here? Why are you here? As in, this isn't the place that you're supposed to be. And Elijah goes off and talks about, I'm the only one left and they're going to kill me. And then it says, hey, Elijah, go stand before the Lord. Step into the very thing that you were faithfully so for so many years. Let's get up. Let's dust ourselves off again. This is God being faithful to Elijah. This is God breathing into Elijah forgiveness. And another thing that you see is that God breathes into him a new purpose. New purpose. Hey, let's get back on the horse. Yeah, we fell down. Yeah, you screwed up. Yeah, you shouldn't be here right now. Yeah, you didn't take care of yourself. Yeah, there's consequences. We could be moving certain things forward. But you know what, Elijah, I love you. And you're my servant. And I'm thankful. Elijah, I have something else for you to do too. Would you go and anoint this king and anoint this king? And I want you to bring someone else into your life who's going to carry the mantle for you when you're done. A young man by the name of Elisha. And these two will have a decades-long friendship together as Elisha walks, Eli, watches Elijah walk before the Lord in faithfulness because God breathed new purpose back into Elijah. I remember when um, our second son was being born, Aiden. Um, Aiden means fiery one. And the pregnancy was going well, and it was delivery time, and it was labor time, and we're in the hospital, and we're in the delivery room, and it's not really very eventful. Um, from where I was, Elise would probably argue 
that it was very eventful. And the doctor says, hey, we seem to kind of be in a quiet spell right now. If you want to go catch your breath, go sit for a while. Um, and so I stepped out and went into the cafeteria area to sit, read, pray, just enjoying the day. And not too long after that, he comes and gets me. The doctor comes back and says, get me. He says, hey, things are happening. You should probably come back. And then as I'm following, he turns and he looks at me and says, hey, don't freak out. Because that's when you start to freak out. Um, Elise is on oxygen now. Things had gotten a little distressed and the baby wasn't getting enough oxygen. And so she, she has some oxygen that she's wearing now. And that's a good thing. More oxygen, the better. Okay? We want her to have all the oxygen that she can possibly get. So this is a good thing. And that was, very, that was really helpful for me. I needed to know that. And there's times when the doctor, the great physician comes into our life and says, you know what? Uh, you need a little bit more oxygen. You need a little bit more breath. You need to catch your breath. The nature of following God is very demanding. And so what are some ways as we think about our time here today that we can catch our breath? Um, Jesus modeled it. He mandated it. So let me suggest uh, a pace, a place, and a practice. If this is completely new to you, or this is something that you've forgotten that you need to be reminded of, pace. Every follower of Christ should catch their breath at certain levels, I think, at three different paces. One of them is a daily rhythm. Daily slowing down to catch your breath. Maybe it's very first thing in the morning. Maybe just five minutes of slowly breathing in and breathing out physically, to prompt yourself spiritually to breathe in the Lord, to pray, to get perspective again, that it's not about you. You're just a faithful servant. It's about what God is doing. We should be doing that daily. We need a daily rhythm, a daily point in our, in our, in our calendar, but also weekly. This is what we call Sabbath, a day where we tell the world we're not showing up. A day where we focus on breathing in God's creation and his goodness and being reminded of his faithfulness, of getting our bearings again and perspective again, of getting back on the path, catching our breath. We need a, a weekly rhythm. And it doesn't sound like it makes sense because the world programs us to go faster and run the rat race and hump, hop on the hump, hamster wheel. But we need to weekly slow down. Even if it's just for three to four hours. But then I would also suggest that every three to four months, <clears throat> you pull way back. You go climb a mountain. You go walk by the water. You retreat to a park or a cabin just for an extended time. Maybe it's a full weekend. Maybe it's a whole day. To let God breathe into you again. So I would suggest a pace. The place, yeah, it needs to be something desolate. It's not going to happen uh, in the middle of your chaos. Now, there are those who've learned to practice silence and solitude in such a way that they can be in the middle of a chaotic storm and they're still centered. We see Jesus doing that as he sleeps in the middle of the storm and the disciples are freaking out. But let me suggest you learn to find a desolate place. That means a place where your phone doesn't reach you, Twitter doesn't find you, Facebook isn't notifying you, a place where the kids can't come in, a place that the spouse respects. But you need a place for daily renewal, a, a weekly gathering moment, a quarterly go away place. I have a place that I go to once the first Wednesday of every month. It's a place that's kind of set aside for me and it's reserved and I go there and it's for prayer and it's for renewal. And so that leads me to the practice. The practice. What do you do there? You listen. You don't talk. God drives the conversation in this passage. God comes to Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing? Elijah, why are you here? Elijah, it's time to do these things. So it's less silence and more listening because you can be silent and not listen. This is about 
assuming a posture of listening. Because it's when God speaks that he recreates. It's when he begins to talk that I become put back together again. Because that's how God created the universe. And that's how God recreates us. He speaks into us. Because we're listening. But to listen, you have to be still. This isn't vacation. This isn't going off to hang out and do a kegger with the buddies. This isn't a weekend away. No, this is an intentional pulling back to catch our breath. It's a spiritual pursuit. I I began by asking the question that God asked Elijah. Why are you here? What are you doing? For some of us, that question comes like a thump in the chest, a hit upside the head, because we're in the wrong place. We've lost our bearing. We've lost our perspective. We've lost our purpose. Some of us who have learned to practice the rhythms of Jesus, to catch our breath, when God asks us, why are you here? Well, if I'm here on a Sunday morning, It's because I want to be renewed in Jesus Christ and I want to breathe in his grace again. If I'm off on a silent retreat, it's because I want to walk in and hear his voice. I want to know my purpose and be reminded and get perspective and bearing again. So let me encourage you as we end this time and transition, enter into a time of prayer and worship. If you've lost your breath, Reach out to an elder, myself. If you're in a place where you can write out a connection card, or talk to a friend, say, I've lost my breath. Let's let God breathe into us again. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, to be gracious to you, to raise up his countenance and to give you peace. God bless. Thank you for sharing your time with us. And we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can. Again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note A member of our Hope team would reach out quickly, promptly to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions.